today, we have Wade Metzler, who is Senior Director of Artists and Industry Relations at Sound Exchange, and Tiara Guy, who's Associate Director of Marketing and Industry Engagement. And so I'm going to hand it off to you guys and let's do a deep dive on Sound Exchange. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. Appreciate you guys having us. Um, let's see. Today we're going to cover, let's see, all things, let's two things, two type kinds of copyright and musical works where the royalties come from, who pays those royalties out. We're gonna go over some neighboring rights and international royalties, and then take a deep dive into our artist and rights owner portals called Sound Exchange Direct, where we'll talk about registration, claiming your works, submitting recordings, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit about letters of direction um, and a little bit on our advocacy work. So Tiara, if you could start us off with a little um, Sound Exchange sizzle reel, we'll, we'll get the party started. All right, guys, so overall what Sound Exchange does is we represent every performing artist and every rights owner or record label for their digital streaming non-interactive royalties. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those royalties are and where they come from. Um, facts, nearly $9 billion in royalties were administered since 2003 at Sound Exchange, which goes about $1 billion in royalties administered in 2021, and that's been for the past four or five years, over $1 billion. Uh, more than 570,000 creators serve and growing every month, 3,600 digital streaming partners, meaning the partners that actually report into us the, the, the music that, that they are playing and what we pay out on. We have partnerships in over 50 countries to collect performance royalties overseas or neighboring rights. So what is a copyright? It's two, two kinds of copyright. There's the underlying music or the notes and lyrics and the sound reporting side, which is the permanent fixation of sound. You can go to the next one, TR. So in this um, example, we use Otis Redding's Respect. So the musical composition or the notes and lyrics side written by Otis Respect. The person that actually made it popular with their sound recording, Aretha Franklin. I mean, Otis obviously had a sound recording of it itself too, which is fantastic, but Aretha Franklin was really the one that made the, the fixation of sounds or the sound recording popular. So where do those, who administers that performance right? On the musical comp composition side, or the Otis Redding side of the song lender, ASCAP, CSAC, BMI, global music, or global music rights represent the songwriter and the publisher for those for those performance royalties. On the sound recording side, or the performance side, the Aretha Franklin side, it's Sound Exchange who represent the artist and musician, and the and or the and the copyright holder for those performance royalties. Obviously, if you are the songwriter and the performer of that work. Um, as it's being reported in, you would collect not only from the musical composition side, but also the sound recording side. Go ahead. Sound exchange royalties and, um, for featured artists and the copyright owners come from satellite radio, internet radio, cable TV radio. So this is a non-interactive play. So a non-interactive transmission is a radio-like transmission. So when you talk about Sirius XM, Pandora, iHeartRadio, these are mostly radio type stations that you were turning into. 
um, where you can pick a certain genre or a certain artist to play like music, you can't pick the exact song and the exact album to play. On that side, it would be an interactive transmission like a Spotify, Apple, YouTube um, transmission, which would be an on-demand transmission, but these are not available through the compulsory license that sign of change governs. Can I jump in real quick? Please. Um, yeah, anytime. If, if, if anyone has questions, just please uh, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll handle uh, the Q&A part uh, right after the presentation. Thanks. Yeah, I agree. So guys, I'm going to uh, move this through this fairly quickly. And so I suggest putting your uh, questions in the chat now so that you remember them at the end. I'm not going to stop in the middle of an answer, but we will answer them all at the end. Okay, the royalty splits by law. 50% goes to the copyright owner, usually the record label. 45% uh, goes directly to the featured artist, and 5% goes to the backup musicians and sessions players through AFM, sag -AFTRA, Intellectual Property Distribution Fund. Now, um, if you are, if in, I guess, I'm guessing a lot of you are going through Symphonic, and you have not only the, on the copyright side, but also are the featured artist, in that case, you were able to collect 95%. So when you would register as an artist, you would also register as that you are the copyright owner and that you are able to receive 95% of those royalties. 5% goes to the musician's fund, no matter what, for backup musicians and session players. Um, royalties are retroactive for three years, meaning that we will hold on to any royalties that have been reported into us um for for the music that the uh, for your music that was played and we're able to hold on to that for three years after three years that money that had if any money has been collected that hasn't been claimed gets distributed to the rest of our artists and rights owners go ahead tiara oh now we'll go to tiara all right please <laughs> Thank you, Wade. Um, okay, so Wade kind of gave you a little bit of a 101 as far as the type of royalty that we collect and distribute and who we um, distribute to. Again, featured performers and sound recording copyright owners. The way that those people will collect their royalties with us is by registering directly. Um, again, Sound Exchange is nonprofit, so it's free to register. And the best way is going to be through our online registration, which you can access through our website. It should only take about 10 minutes if you have the information you need. Um, we are offering this in Spanish as well. If you see the bottom um, left-hand corner and you need to go through the registration in Spanish, um, we hope to be able to offer it in more languages in the future. Um, but so you're not gonna use the online registration to update an existing account. And unfortunately, if you're registering um, a performer who's passed or, you know, you represent their estate, you won't be able to use the online registration either. Um, we require additional paper, paperwork to um, set up those types of accounts. Um, so you're going to need to contact us directly. Um, but so if you are um, a representative or the performer or rights owner directly, this is, you know, how you'll register with Sound Exchange. Um, when you're getting set up, you're going to let us know, are you registering yourself or is the performer, you know, authorizing someone to register on their behalf? Um, that being said, the payment still has to go directly to the performer um, as an individual or to a company that they wholly own. Um, but they can authorize that representative to fill it out for them. And that representative can be the primary contact on their account and manage the account. Um, but you'll kind of select those details before you get started. Is the registration for just the performer side, for just the rights owner side, or both? Um, the registration serves as a way to set up your payment place. Um, so this is where we'll ask how you want to get paid um, as an individual, as a company. Will you do direct deposit? international wire? Will it be a physical check in the mail? Those are the types of details that you'll be doing in the registration, um, tax information, things like that. We don't do actual repertoire claiming as part of the registration process. That will come after. Um, but just think of the registration as a way to set up a payment place. Like I said, it should take 10 minutes as long as you have everything you need. Um, if you're a band and you represent an entire band, each performer has to authorize you as the representative in order for you to manage the account. So please keep that in mind. Um, after you submit the registration, it's going to kind of roll right into our membership step. 
Um, the main benefit of becoming a member, if you just register with Sound Exchange, um, that handles collection of US domestic royalties. Um, but if you take that additional step, which is basically a signature and what we call our international mandate, um, you can authorize Sound Exchange to collect international royalties on your behalf as well. Um, so again, that will roll right in um, to that membership step from the registration. You can choose um, to become a member and then let us know where you'd like us to collect using that mandate. You know, worldwide, which means it would encompass what we have, um, they're called reciprocal agreements with other collection management organizations around the world, where they collect for our artists and performers, we collect for theirs and then swap the money. Um, you can basically customize your mandate however you want. Worldwide encompasses all the agreements we have in place. We have a full list of all the agreements and territories that we cover on our website. Um, you can do US only. You can choose you know, whichever territories you want us to collect in. Um, and it's totally customizable. But Sound Exchange does have one of the lowest admin rates in the world. Um, and so you can definitely read more about membership, about international collection. Um, and if you have any questions, let us know. But that's definitely the biggest benefit of becoming a member in addition to just being registered. So once you get registered with us, um, you're going to whoever the primary contact on that account is, is gonna be given access to our online portal. It's called SX Direct. This is where you view statements. This is how you claim recordings. This is how you update you know, account information as well as a slew of other features and tools that we're gonna to touch on um, through this presentation. But as far as who actually has access, like I said, whoever the primary contact was that you used as part of that registration process and gave us contact information for, they're going to receive a welcome email that has a link for them to, to create their login for this portal. So there can only be one primary contact on the account at all times, and that person has um, the privileges of basically editing payment information. That being said, there can be up to 50 guests on an account. So guests cannot edit payment. <laughs> Information like the primary contact can. However, when either the artist or the primary contact adds a guest contact to the account, they will grant privileges, or as you say, it's guest rights, as you can see on the screen. And those rights either include view only, which basically means look but don't touch. Maybe they need access to statements. Um, and so you would grant them, you know, guest rights with view only, or perhaps they need view with repertoire, which means that they can help manage the catalog and claims and do some of that legwork on behalf of the payee that um, they've been granted access to. Um, we make it really easy to add these guests through the portal. Um, we also have an actual form if you need that instead. Um, but again, up to 50 guests on the account, but only the primary can edit payment information. So once you're kind of logged into the SX Direct portal, your dashboard is going to show the payees that you actually represent. That means whatever email address that you're logged in as, whichever accounts you're associated to with that email address will show up in your dashboard. Um, basically, if you're representing an artist or like a band, um, we call the performers the actual members of that band or the performer that makes up that artist name. So for example, if the artist is Eminem, the performer is Marshall Mathers. And so you're going to see that granular detail of the members who make up that artist name. So think of performer as their legal name. And we're going to want you to verify that we have those details correct. You know, if it is a band, do we have all the appropriate members that make up that artist? Um, and this is really important for us claiming internationally, just because international collection is done on the performer level rather than the artist level. So we need to make sure we have the appropriate details, birth date, so we can dif differentiate performers of the same name with other performers in our system. Yeah. Um, this also allows Sorry, Tiara, more, real quick, guys, So, because I see some questions popping up here. Um, we do have a guide that will be available to you at the end of this that walks you through all of these different things that Tiara is talking about, so that you have blog posts on them as well as kind of step-by-step -step directions. So um, uh, I know it's a lot of information to take in as we go through it, so just know that there will be a follow-up on it as well. Sorry, Tiara, go ahead. No, thanks, Ed. Um so yeah, jumping back into performers, the other nice thing about having um, performer-based 
uh, information and data is that you can do performer-based claiming, which is really best for bands that have had rotating lineups throughout yeah. the years and um, different lineups on different albums. So essentially you can create different lineups with the different performers that are associated with your account. And then that allows you to actually, you know, claim recordings based on those different lineups with the hope that distribution on the back end will be much easier and that the right uh, money will get into the right hands of the correct performers for those recordings. Um, so we also are able to offer a uh, rights owner entity creation within the portal. And what this means that is in the past, if you registered as an artist or as a featured performer, but you forgot to say that you are also a sound recording copyright owner, you used to have to completely go through the online registration again. Um, now we offer, if you're already in the portal as a performer, um, you can actually create a rights owner profile in the portal without having to completely re-register. Um, and then you can just immediately start claiming recordings as a rights owner as well. Um, that being said, unfortunately, we can't do it the other way around at this point, where if you're registered as a rights owner and you actually are also an artist, um, you can't create a, a performer or art, artist profile within the portal. In that case, you will have to submit a new registration just because we require a lot more detail on the performer side than we do on the rights owner side. Um, but we're really um, happy to be able to at least offer this on the rights owner side and get you to be able to actively start claiming recordings as a rights owner almost instantaneously in that portal. And I would add one, one thing to that is that if you if you do claim it, do make sure you are the rights owner as well. So otherwise, it it shows up as an overlap or a dispute on our end. To make sure that the other either record label that you're going through or what have you is not claiming on that side as well. And we'll cover that a little bit more as well. Yep. So this is definitely going to be the feature I would say that you want to pay the most attention to. So as I mentioned, registration handles uh, creation of your actual payment place, but the search and claim tool is how you're actually going to claim recordings that need to be linked to your account for payment. So once you're logged in and um, there's going to be a tab called my catalog, you'll select the search and claim tool. Um, you'll let us know, are you claiming as an artist or as a rights owner? And then you'll be given these uh, four fields, uh, title, artist, ISRC, code, or album, where you can search by any one of them. And then all the results that pull back based on your search criteria are any recordings that kind of match it that are not already linked for payment to your account. So once you search for what you're looking for, recordings will pop up. You will select the recordings that you believe are yours that you want to make a claim on. You'll add them to the cart, let us know what percentage you're claiming, and submit your claims. Um, now, for the artist side, that's a little bit easier because the performers on a recording, on a particular recording, will never change. That being said, on the rights owner side, we understand that it can be, uh, you know, the recording can be bought, sold, licensed. And so in addition to not only the percentage that you're claiming of the recording, we'll ask for the date range um, that you're, you're claiming for that recording. Is it inception of perpetuity? Is it a particular year? You know, you can get as granular on that date and submit that as well as the percentage that you're claiming. So once you submit those claims, you'll know that they've been processed and linked to your account for payment because they'll show up in your associated recordings which is another tab under the My Catalog um, tab at the top. So you'll see how many recordings are linked to your account as both an artist and as a rights owner. And then where you see that actual number, you'll notice it's hyperlinked. So you can actually drill down to all the particular recordings if you wanna see everything. Um, we were definitely wanting to include this, this feature because people would call Sound Exchange all the time saying, you know, did you associate this recording to my account? You know, it's not showing up on my statement. I want to make sure that you've linked it to my account. So this way, you know what is linked to your account. And then obviously your statement is going to show you what you're actually being paid for and what's been reported as stream to Sound Exchange. But this way, you know, we've associated it to your account. You can see that it's linked. That being said, we definitely recommend using our search and claim tool, um, at least on a quarterly basis. There are misspellings, variations of metadata that come in from the licensees who send us, you know, the metadata for what they've streamed. And it's not always, you know, in the best um, format or they're missing information. Again, you'll want to search for common misspellings of your artist name or rights owner name. 
um, just to make sure nothing's slipping through the cracks and that everything that really looks like it is yours is linked to your account for payment. That being said, um, while we get this metadata from the license, licensees who are streaming um, the actual content, we ask that the sound recording copyright owners submit their metadata directly to us. Um, we find that the rights owners are going to, you know, ensure that they're submitting the best version of the metadata to us, that it will be complete. There are, you know, mandatory fields that we require when you're submitting um, that metadata to us so that we can ensure we have the best version on file and that we can kind of map these bad versions of metadata to the best version. Um, and so you can submit that. Um, you know, one or two releases at a time, or we have a bulk upload feature, which is essentially like a massive spreadsheet that you can use to submit hundreds, thousands of recordings at a time, um, as well as actually claiming the percentage that you're claiming as the rights owner for those recordings. Um, and that way you can track, you know, your upload history of when you submitted it to us. Um, we're also able to use this metadata to build an ISRC database that's available to the public on our website. Um, you know, Sound Exchange found that there was no kind of central place for our industry to go and search for ISRC codes for recordings. So Sound Exchange built it, made it available to the public on our website, and we, you know, build that database with metadata directly from the sound recording copyright owners. So as Wade mentioned, um, overlaps and disputes uh, can become a thing when there are claims from multiple different parties on the same recordings. Um, as far as what we're able to offer in the portal, um, we're only able to offer this feature for rights owners in the portal currently. Um, basically, if a claim comes in that overlaps with a claim you've already made, it's going to trigger this overlap. And you'll basically this tab does not show up in the portal unless you have an active overlap or dispute. And this will allow you to see in real time, you know, who the other claimant is, what claim that they're making that is causing the overlap. Is it a percentage claim? Is it a date range? Um, and it allows you to either relinquish your claim, maintain it as is, or edit it. You know, perhaps you did put in the wrong date or the wrong percentage. Um, but basically, the other, you have 90 days to respond. If you do not respond in that 90 day window, then you're automatically relinquishing your claim on that recording. Um, once you do basically take the action you need to on that overlap, the other party has 90 days to respond. And again, if they don't answer, they relinquish. That being said, if you've had an overlap in place and you accidentally let that 90 day window go by and you actually meant to maintain your claim, you would have to go through search and claim and reclaim that recording to start the process again if you needed to. But that being said, we send weekly emails that are automated if you have any overlaps and disputes um, that are currently in place. Um, even if you don't have action that's required and it's sitting with the other claimant, it's just a weekly reminder to let you know which recordings are in overlap or dispute. Um, and we've seen just a ton of um, overlaps and disputes resolved, you know, just directly from this tool. If both parties maintain that overlap after the 90 days and don't sort it out, um, again, with the 90 days that sit with both of them, then what happens is the overlap moves to the dispute process. We place the recordings on hold and provide contact information to both the claimants for the other. And then it's basically up to you to work it out and let Sound Exchange know how it should pay out. Otherwise, the recording remains on hold. Now, this does happen on the artist side as well, and we have an artist resolution team that reaches out directly to mediate, but we're not currently able to offer it in the portal yet. Um, so again, this is for rights owners only, um, and, it, and we've seen it resolve a lot of um, holds in a really quick manner. Again, sometimes metadata that comes in from other licensees is just wrong, um, and they have the wrong name in the label field. Or, and so uh, people are usually pretty good about relinquishing when um, a claim was made in mistake, um, but we just you know definitely pay attention to those weekly emails if there's any action required. So next, we wanted to touch on letters of direction just because we get a lot of questions about this. Um, for those who don't know, letters of direction are what a featured artist can use to allocate a percentage of their royalty to a creative participant on the recording. Um, so traditionally, that's a producer, mixer, or engineer. 
um, and they can actually fill out this registration that says, you know, I'll give this percentage to this producer, mixer, engineer for these particular recordings um, when they're reported to Sound Exchange. The letter of direction serves as a way for us to create an account um, for that producer, mixer, engineer to get paid. That being said, they're not viewed as registered directly with Sound Exchange, which means they can't claim recordings through search and claim as a producer, mixer, engineer, but they'll be able to see what LODs are active on their account, what they're getting paid for, obviously their statements. Um, but we definitely like to mention that if this is a recording that is a collaboration between multiple featured artists, that producer, mixer, or engineer is going to want to secure letters of direction from each of the featured artists. Um, if they're looking to get a percentage on the full artist portion. So what that looks like, let's say it's a recording and the collaboration is between Jay-Z and Rihanna and Pharrell is the producer and Jay-Z has submitted an LOD for Pharrell for 10% of his 50% because him and Rihanna split it equally. Pharrell isn't getting 10% of Rihanna's 50. So he would need to secure letters of direction from Jay-Z and from Rihanna in order to get 10% of the full 100% on the artist side. Um, and then just make sure you're using the most up-to-date letter of direction um, in that paperwork. It's available on our website. And as Wade mentioned, we have resources we're sharing at the end so that you can ensure you have the most up-to-date paperwork. All right. Thanks, Wade. you are. Um, let's see our advocacy. So we're just going to touch on a few things that we're working on on our side. Um, that's funny. Somebody's writing on that. You see that? Yeah. Um, okay. So the American Music Fairness Act. So, so in the United States, there is not a performance royalty when you talk about terrestrial radio or AM FM royalty for the actual performer and rights owner. So as there is a royalty performance royalty for the songwriter and publisher when a song is played on terrestrial radio, the performer and record label do not get paid. So in the in the example of Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin, when that same song is played on AM FM radio, Otis Redding gets paid, but Aretha does not. Even though that same tra transmission as it is, is, is um, broadcast digitally um, through the website or what have you, through a streaming service, then it does get paid to the performing artist and the record label. So it's, it's, it, to, we think it's a crime and we think it's insane. So what, what, it, what happens is, is since the United States does not reciprocate or does not pay this royalty to the artist and the, and the, and the record label, other nations do not reciprocate when a US-based artist is being played on radio within that territory. So not only are the artists and the performing and, and the record label missing out on the money that is earned in the United States, in most cases, it's missing out on when that song is played on terrestrial radio anywhere. Um, so the American Music Fairness Act aim, aims to uh, correct that. Um, there is there is some great momentum that is going on with this, but obviously when you guys, there is also in this sheet that we're talking about, there's a way for you guys to take action. There's also, if you scan this code in the bottom right-hand cor cor corner of this, you're able to take action immediately as well in your territory to get your representatives involved as well. Now, there are some things around that that we're trying to kind of navigate around this and this is through national treatment. So national treatment, what that does is actual agreements with territories specifically to be able to have our creators be treated the same as the creators that are in that territory, that nationality. So we've been able to work out good um, treaties with really through a trade agreement through Canada and Mexico as well as with the EU, which is in the process right now. And really the main one we're working on is trying to get something to go with the UK. So there, this is more of a workaround, um, maybe a band-aid to the American Music Fairness Act, but attempt in, attempting to get something in place just in case something in the American Music Fairness Act doesn't come through. Um, fun fact that the there's only four industrialized nations that we know of that do not pay 
a performance royalty to the actual performer and record label. And it's Iraq, North Korea, um, China, and the United States. So obviously, as far as paying out copyright, we're not in the best, best company in that comes to. So the Copyright Royalty Board is something where we represent the recording industry and the royalty rate proceedings. So these come every few years and whether it be satellite, whether it be um, internet streaming, et cetera, we represent the artists and copyright owners in, the, in those hearings to make sure that we continue to fight for fair royalties being paid out on each service. Yeah, and just, just to add to that, Wade, like if you are an artist that is passionate about advocacy and about this right in our country, there are public ways, like as you see, Dionne Warwick helped introduce legislation with, along with a slew of other artists, you know, on the Hill, and there's more private ways um, to help like that letter to your congressman and things like that. So we definitely want to make it easy and whatever level you're comfortable with it getting involved if you're passionate about this issue. Perfect. All right. Um, that being said, just, you know, along with what I'm sure you might have noticed, Sound Exchange had a little bit of a uh, refresh on our brand, um, along with the video and the app that we offer, you know, for your statements and things. But we're looking for more ways to collaborate with artists and we've launched some new franchises, one um, called Breakthrough Beats. And this recognizes artists who have earned the majority of their royalties um, in the last three months. And we've done, um, you know, a showcase featuring several of these artists. We're doing social campaigns around just, um, you know, exposing them to a larger audience, um, you know, bringing light to the awesome success they're having and what they're doing. Um, so we definitely recommend, you know, submitting any artists you think, you know, might fall into this category for our Breakthrough Beat series, because we would just love to elevate their work and um, be able to share it, you know, with a broader audience. Um, we're also doing something called sound advice when we're out at different events and festivals or for artists that are in different markets that sound exchange might be in where, you know, it's really a creator generated um, content for creators. So we have like really great stories, pieces of advice that they've learned throughout their careers or, um, and, you know, we just really want to get more, you know, creator based uh content out there. So if you're, you know, interested in doing that, or if you're catching up with us, like I said, at a conference or a festival, um, we'd love to get some sound advice from what you've experienced in your career. Um, and then we have creator spotlights that we're doing on our website um, that are kind of more like deep dive, like uh, Q and A's um, with different artists um, and just highlighting them on our website. So we would just love to collaborate with more of the artist community and, you know, bring, again, more exposure and um, highlight really exciting things going on in our industry. So that being said, so as Wade mentioned, if you scan this QR code, it will link to the resources we have that cover um, a lot of what we just went through in our presentation and links to helpful blog posts and again, letters of direction, documents, and you know, if you're interested in advocacy and hopefully we'll just you know, provide a way forward on any more information you need for any of those areas. All right, Steve, I think that includes our concludes our presentation. If you want, I saw some good um, questions in the chat. So if maybe if you want to let us uh, know what, what's going on or how you want to do this, it'd be great. Okay, uh, before the Q&A, just a brief thing about Symphonic's capabilities uh, for our clients regarding Sound Exchange and neighboring rights through Sound Exchange. Um, what we can do, uh, if you're a Symphonic client is you can opt in to Sound Exchange if you haven't already, or the international mandate they were mentioning, which is where they collect in, I believe it's 35 territories and about 45 various CMOs in the territories. So uh, in order to do that, you can opt in uh, through Symphonic. Uh, it's a simple form and an addendum that you would uh, sign to your agreement. And for ease of use, we would deliver you your releases to either Sound Exchange or, or the international mandate uh, of Sound Exchange, which we were calling neighboring rights. Um, and rather than filling out your own forms and dealing with your own overlaps with other parties, we would deal with that for you. So uh, it's an ease of use issue. And it's also a, a great way to make sure you know your entire catalog can get out 
uh, to Sound Exchange. So if you are wanting that, we can uh, share a link here in the chat um, for uh, enabling Sound Exchange uh, through Symphonic. Just wanted to put that in there. Um, yeah, that's great, Steve. I think on that on that note, just uh, when you go through Symphonic for the rights owner side, make sure that you sign up as a uh, performing artist because we can only pay the performing artist directly. So at least for that, forty five percent on that side. Right. I, yes. So to clarify, rights owner is uh, meaning the label side or the sound recording rights holder. Um, so. Just, just for clarity, we we at Symphonic don't collect the artist side at all. So you could deliver your your catalog of sound recordings via sound recording, uh, excuse me, via via Symphonic, and then you could also do your own account on the artist and performer side. Yeah, this is just one of those strange things, uh, outlanding things that um, we can only pay the artist directly. Where when it comes to a lot of other royalties that come in, they are able to go directly through Symphonic or who, whoever. Um, um, fortunately, um, it, we are only able to we pay the artists directly for that share. Yep. Cool. All right, well, just to jump into some questions. Um, a few of you did have, you know, questions about um, tutorials, more information, the types of territories we cover in our international collection. That resource guide for this QR code will have a lot of that information. Um, again, for international collection, um, when you go to this resource, it will have a link to the page on our website that will show you each territory we cover and if it's the performer side, the rights owner side, or both. Um, and again, we covered registration, which a few people asked about. Um, and then someone said, if they're registered with, let's say, PPL in the UK, um, what would be the benefit from having an account with Sound Exchange as well? Um, and what I would say there is, if you're going with the Sound with Sound Exchange for the US only, at least, and you kind of were to limit your mandate with PPL, then you're not paying two different admin fees on the money. Um, that's being collected because once Sound Exchange collects, if we have to send that, when we're collecting. Um, from the licensees in the US, Sound Exchange has, like I said, one of the lowest admin rates in the world, but we have to take our admin rate from the top. And then we send that money to PPL, who then takes their admin rate as well. So you're kind of double dipping with that admin rate when it includes, you know, collection in the other territories. So if you're registering at least with Sound Exchange in the US only, um, it's only going to be subject to our admin rate. Right. And you would also get the benefit if you were to do the international mandate and get rid of your PPL deal uh, that you have directly, then uh, Sound Exchange is going to PPL as part of that international mandate and also the other territories if you have action there. So it could make more sense to just go through Sound Exchange. I'd also like to mention that um, I forgot to touch on this with letters of direction, but an artist has to be registered directly with Sound Exchange in order for us to honor a letter of direction for a producer, mixer, engineer on their recordings. Um, so I forgot to mention that part as well. We cannot honor the LOD if the artist is not registered. So say even if the artist is registered with PPL and someone we have a reciprocal agreement with, but doesn't isn't registered with Sound Exchange, the um, for, say the the uh, mixer producer is not able to collect on that through an LOD because they don't have the same practice as we do. Um, someone asked about um, if they're part of a band and they have like writers helping. So again, Sound Exchange isn't going to be covering the writing, publishing, composing side of the recordings. That's going to be BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. Um, we're going to be covering the featured performance. So um, yeah, you're not going to want to, you, you don't need to provide us with like writer splits or things like that, that you'd have to provide them with. We're just um, going to be concerned with who is actually featured on the recordings. And if you're a band that's being paid as individuals and not through a collective company, you know, or LLC, then we're going to ask you for the breakdown of what percentage each member should be receiving on each recording. Right. So on that on that side, if if you have different songwriters that aren't actually the performers, then the songwriters would have to claim their percentage with ASCAP BMI, and do the performers would have to claim on our side. Yep. 
Yeah, it all derives from the sound recordings. Yeah, publishing is a whole separate deal. Somebody asks, want to know if you write and record a song over an instrumental you don't own, what would be the consequence long term? Now, if you were to get, I'm thinking this is for like shared beats and things like that. Uh, if you were to get an exclusive license, you don't have to be the owner, you would be the primary rights holder in that case. But uh, Wade or Tiara, what, what do you think about this, the non-exclusivity of a track as it relates to sound exchange? What is that question again? I'm not sure if I completely understand. I was I was reading another question, so I <laughs> I really apologize to you. <laughs> uh, they want to know if you write and record a song over an instrumental you don't own, what would be the consequence long term? Well, so again, that that sounds like it speaks to writing, which we're not concerned with. Um, again, it's who's performing on it. So, so that I mean, sounds like that, that I think sounds, I think, think they mean a non-exclusive beat, like in a genre like hip hop, you know, uh, like and you sampling? can get, well, no, like you can, you can purchase beats from producers, right? And you can also purchase an exclusive use of that beat. So they don't necessarily own it, but they have, they would be the primary rights holder. Yeah, but it, it's a work for hire in that case, usually. So right. it's if you're right. selling, selling that beat, it, then it goes directly to your track. Unless, you know, it depends on what that agreement is with that person mm -hmm. that has, has that a lot of times on, when it comes to sampling, I mean, uh, on the writer's credit, sometimes on the performer's credit, you will see um, the individual getting a piece of whatever that sample or that beat is. Or once but, you're using it to create your new version of that recording, it becomes its own unique recording. It would have its own ISRC code. It would be like, this is just like a remix. Like it's a new version of a particular recording. So Sound Exchange views it as a completely separate recording. Okay. So, yeah. so like a, a shared beat is not necessarily a problem as long as it's a distinctive uh, recording and an ISRC that's distinct. Yep. Okay, correct. it's good to know. The same uh, user asks, does Sound Exchange distribute royalties for Apple Radio? Well, we used to. So Sound, uh, Apple Radio and Spotify Radio used to be, but that was years ago. So once they redid their um, agreements with the rights owners, which is usually the, the record labels, um, and distributors, they, that was included. Their radio services were included in those deals. So we no longer pay out on those radios. That's a great question. That'll come directly through the rights owner, distributor, et cetera, who has ever has your, the deal with those uh, interactive services. Yeah. Someone asked about the importance of the ISRC code. I mean, it's very important. It's the unique identifying code on your particular recording. So as I kind of mentioned, we won't require a metadata upload from a sound recording copyright owner unless we have that ISRC code. Um, and again, like it's important, not from the artist side as much because they're not gonna be submitting metadata directly to us, but if they also own the recording, like not only are you gonna to wanna to like copyright your recording and have that unique metadata that has your ISRC code so that you can actively track like when it's being played, when it's being streamed on any of these services, it allows us to more accurately account for what you should be earning for that recording. Um, I would say it's extremely important. Someone asks, like Social Security phone, so. uh, can you register as a label? And the answer to that is yes. Yeah, so the label is the sound recording copyright owner in this case. So like we said, it's typically a record label. Again, if you're an artist who owns your own recordings and what you put out, you are the label. You are the sound recording copyright owner and you would definitely want to register as such. Um, this will allow you, like I said, to upload metadata for the projects that you're releasing. And yes, it's a completely separate portion from the performer side. So if you are both, you need to register as both in order to collect both portions. I uh, think someone asked if is there a way to register without UPC? I, so I don't know the answer to that. On the rights owner side, we we require it in order for you to update. What I will say, if you're a rights owner and using search and claim to claim your recordings, um, then you don't need to provide it. We will ask if you can fill in that missing piece of metadata. We'll ask if you can um, provide it. But if you're uploading metadata to us, we require it. it's a mandatory field um, for you to have. 
But that being said, if that recording's been streamed by a licensee and the metadata is in our system and might be missing the UPC code, you can still claim it and we will link it for payment. Um, I see another one here that's, it says, so to be clear, say the artist is registered with sound exchange but the rights owner isn't this is in regards to letters of direction but the rights owner isn't then the producer would be able to file their lod against the portion of the artist rights percentage question mark but not the other way around say it's the rights owner is registered but not the artist that would that would not be possible for for the producer so the letters of direction only come from the performing artist side. So the artist would have to be registered with sound exchange. If, if the label is not, is not registered with sound exchange, it wouldn't come into play here because the letter of direction only goes through the performing artist side. Hopefully that answers that question. If someone needs to be collecting on the rights owner side directly, they can just register and claim their percentage directly as a rights owner. Correct they don't need the letter of direction necessarily, right? Like they can just register and claim their percentage that they should be collecting as a rights owner. Um, somebody else asked about limitations on who can register as like a primary contact. So again, using this word register, um, if you are a representative and you wanna be the primary contact on your artist's account, you are not registering with sound exchange you are getting authorized by your artist or performers that you represent to handle the administration of their account so when you're filling out the registration you're still doing it for the artists or the performers that you represent but your contact information is going to be for you but the payment is still for them the name that the payment has to be made in is for them or to their company um, but so you're not seen as the registrant, you're just seen as the contact and you have access to the portal, you can claim recordings for them, but you're not seen as the registrant. So hopefully that helps kind of clarify that. And you can be, you can be authorized on multiple accounts. Let's say you, you're a manager and you have a roster of 15 different artists. You can become the primary or guest contact on all 15 accounts to be able to help manage their catalog and claims. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to get paid directly for any of your clients. Like you're just going to be helping, you know, on the admin side for them and making sure everything's in order and the communications that come from sound exchange will go to you. And the, again, the performers have to authorize you to do that and they can revoke you at any time as well. Um, Thank you, Ali. Ali added that as far as UPC importance goes and ISRC codes, they're required by most music services in order to get your songs, you know, placed um, with different services. Somebody asked if South Africa is one of the territories for the international mandate. I, I don't believe so. Unfortunately, I believe Africa in general, but um, there is a full list on our website in regards, and I think it's even in this QR code sheet that has a link to all of this, all of the uh, territories that we are able to collect and distribute from. Let me just double checking that. All right. <laughs> Someone said I get a lot of artists who understand the creative side but don't understand the tedious side. Um, so sound exchange tries to make it as easy as possible. Wade and I are here to help anybody. Part of this QR code will give you our direct contact information. We don't want this to be hard for you. We want it, you know, to be easy. This is one of the reasons we created this portal. Not only do we want to have transparency for you on what's going on in your account and being able to check in regularly, we have that mobile app now for your statements, but we want to help you through this process so it does not feel tedious. So please feel free to ping us like if you need any help um, or have any other specific questions that we maybe weren't able to touch on today. Um, but we definitely want, we wanna get these royalties into your hands and we wanna make it easy to do that. So please feel free to reach out um, with anything you might need. And if you were to deliver your sound recordings um, to sound exchange via Symphonic, it becomes really easy because it's just going out as it would to other DSPs via your release. All right, Steve, does, does that look like we uh, handle most of those questions? I think not so. All. all right, it's it sounds like we're wrapping up. So any other questions?
jump on it, folks. We'd like to thank you all again for attending. This has been great. Thank you to Wade, Tiara, for your expertise. Of course, I think it did something else just come in real quick. It's just uh, salutations, looks like. Fantastic. Celebrations. <laughs> All right, cool. If you guys have any other questions, obviously get in touch with Tiara or myself um, via email, and uh, we'll try to help you out as much as possible. Steve, Steve also is very, uh, knows his way around sound exchange as well, too. So he can also help very heavily on the symphonic side, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah.